Hello everyone. This week we'll be talking about aestheticism and the aesthetic movement, which uh, flourished in the towards the end of the 19th century. Now we all know that aesthetics is a very interesting and very appealing concept, but at the same time, it is not really easy to talk about uh, aestheticism or what makes something aesthetic or how you find or if you find something aesthetically appealing. Um, when you look at a painting, you will come across with um, different colors, shapes, lines, brush strokes, um, and some figures and some concepts or messages. So in that sense, an artwork, especially a painting or a sculpture, um, speaks to you. It tells something to you. Or from another corner, you uh, interact with that painting. Whatever you have down here, you just um, find uh, them in uh, the painting or a sculpture. So it is very difficult to talk about aestheticism and the, um, what makes something aesthetically acceptable. Um, one person's um, taste might be, and to a certain extent is, different from another, which makes um, the concept of aesthetics even more difficult to talk about. So throughout history, if you remember, especially when you consider the, the situation or the, um, the, uh, the ideas proposed by Horace, um, what makes something beautiful or what uh, is beautiful has always been a major um, um, topic for discussion uh, in art history uh, as well as in religion and um, especially social sciences. What I'm trying to say is that um, talking about aesthetics is very difficult and there are uh, a great variety of ideas um, that uh, makes this uh, discussion on aesthetics uh, even more difficult. However, um, from the beginning of history, we have always, as human beings, enjoyed talking about um, what makes something beautiful, what is beautiful, what is ugly, what is acceptable, and so on. All these questions boil down into um, one single item about which we will talk um, in the couple um, slides um, that uh, are coming one after another. Um, so, uh, let's start with the painting and talk about what makes it beautiful, if you like, and then we will move on to discussing uh, aestheticism and the aesthetic movement, uh, a, a very important uh, trend of thought in the 19th century Britain. This painting is considered to be one of the finest masterpieces in uh, art history. It uh, costs millions. Um, it has a great number of um, replicas on t-shirts, on mugs, on uh, uh, clothing, textile, industry, and so on, let alone um, as an artwork, it is uh, valued by millions and millions of people all around the world. I don't know if you like this painting. If you ask me, I do not really find it very appealing. I do not really like it. Um, I can explain why. Um, there are too many colors and um, the colors I like are not really there. There is very little purple. Um, 
there is very little um, dark blue um, and uh, it doesn't really give me anything conceptually um, it doesn't have a message it doesn't have a profound solid direct um, philosophy it's just a street two people are walking and I ask so what am I alone of course, there are many people who do not really enjoy or like this painting. However, this doesn't mean that, um, obviously, it is not aesthetically appealing. It is not beautiful as an artwork because there are millions of people who love and adore this painting. So, my interaction with this painting shows that obviously for a variety of reasons or because of a variety of reasons I do not find this artwork particularly enjoyable or even successful so what makes art beautiful what makes art then aesthetically uh, acceptable well we can talk about a few things. First, the person, the viewer, the reader. It's a matter of taste. You may like it or you may not. Is there universality in art? That is to say, when you look at this painting, for instance, does everybody like it? Is there a law stating that you know a hidden law stating that everyone must enjoy this painting of course not but one way or another um, art will um, always highlight an aspect of universal being that is to say it should be enjoyed by many many people uh, to consider that beautiful another I idea uh, is proposed about um, aesthetics which is about uh, the simplicity of the artwork art should speak to the viewer or the reader therefore it must be understandable it must be relatable it must talk to you um, whether it's you know a painting or an or a sculpture or a, a literary artwork you cannot enjoy you cannot really like you cannot talk about or you cannot explain why you like uh, if you do not understand uh, the painting that's not to say understanding the message but understanding the colors textures and um, the shades and light and so on this brings us into the discussion of the message um, the uh, artwork or a literary uh, text uh, is not uh, specifically created for the artist's workshop or the writer's desk or a library, but it is uh, created for all humanity. It is created for villages, it is created for nature, it is created for uh, spaceships everywhere. So in that sense, there must be clear and meaningful and also um, acceptable uh, message in the artwork um, and the most difficult one uh, that uh, we have to um, deal with in our understanding or in our uh, explanation of um, what makes art beautiful is um, that the artwork or the literary piece must be artistic and the aesthetic which is the most difficult one to um, explain um, part of this reason uh, part of this difficulty is that aesthetics is the field of philosophy 
that deals with nat nature and appreciation of art, beauty, and taste. As you can see, these are all uh, abstract ideas or abstract uh, beings. So, um, um, in that sense, uh, sometimes um, beauty may not be the artist's or the or the writer's ultimate goal. Um, art maybe the artist that did not really care about beauty but he or she tried to do something else on the canvas or on uh, the paper so um, it, in that sense um, talking about aesthetics is again a, a, a matter of personal taste has it always been like that well we'll talk about it in the following slides but my final question and my first question is do you like this painting what makes it beautiful what makes it aesthetically appealing or acceptable for you think about your um, ideas maybe you should write them down and consider um, talking to some friends in the discussion section to explain uh, your position uh, in regards to the beauty of this painting. You will see that our discussion this week will, um, pre will leave us uh, in front of a bifurcation. Is art just for art or should art include some messages for society so if you look at the painting above you will see that um, this does not really have a message compared to the one below so we will work on this uh, in this mode whether the status of arts the function of arts is um, closely aligned with um, the style or the content this discussion will remind you of the uh, difference between plato and aristo which was then re-articulated by horse this again discussion will show that uh, although there is a 2,000 um, years um, difference, um, the, 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 the function of uh, literature and arts has always been a matter of debate in human history. Well, at least for the aesthetes, aesthetic experience um, was sensory. It is or it was by no means conceptual or political or even moral thus it is difficult to put our aesthetic experiences into language if you look at the painting on the right uh, Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night we can agree that it's a beautiful painting but can we explain can we easily explain what makes it beautiful? If you remember how I started this uh, session by looking at a world-renowned painting and stating obviously that I did not quite like that painting, you must have noticed that I could not really explain myself why I disliked that painting. I didn't say that the painting was ugly. All I said was I didn't find it appealing. I didn't like it. In order to try and explain aesthetic experience in that sense, aesthetic theories of the arts have attempted to assign different types of sensory experience to each art. How we read a painting is different from how we read a poem. 
How we talk about a sculpture is to a great extent different from how we approach a, a music piece. In that sense, aesthetic experience and talking about aesthetic experience is not a matter of liking or not liking. It's about defining what makes an artwork beautiful and then moving on to studying the artwork in terms of how we approached beauty as we had stated in the beginning of our study of the aesthetic experience. When you look at um, the place, importance and uh, meaning of arts in the 19th century Britain, you see that the, um, the most powerful movement uh, across these years uh, was uh, a slogan that is antithetical to art for art's sake. In the 19th century Britain, like the rest of uh, Europe, um, artists uh, and uh, writers uh, worked um, in close association with what we would call art for people's sake. Victorians believed that literature and art fulfilled important social and political roles. Literature provided models of correct behavior. Therefore, uh, by reading novels, um, women uh, could learn manners. Uh, by reading high quality novels, Victorians then learned how to behave correctly in their social circles. If you look at um, the novels written and published in the 19th century, you see that good characters with expected actions were rewarded and those who went against societal rules or norms were severely punished. Oftentimes these um, faulty characters were not punished by the government, but their um, fates, their ends, were horrible. Um, therefore, 19th century British novel is or was um, a body of literature that uh, was written in accordance with um, Plato's moral criticism. This painting will illustrate how Victorians perceived art. If you look at the uh, content of this painting, you will see a young lady sitting with her, most probably tea, reading a book. You see that she is from a, you know, well-fed family paintings, the room, accessories, and the, uh, if you look at that coffee table, which became uh, popular in, 19th, in the 19th century in England, which is from uh, the East, Pakistan, or an Arab country, um, you will see that this is uh, a painting of an upper class, um, both in subject matter as well as um, the people who enjoyed this painting in their homes. But what is significantly important in this painting is that it teaches how to behave. You see that this young lady is sitting in her living room with her cat and tea, reading, and that's it.
So this was this was the role uh, tailored for the women uh, of the Victorian era. I'm not generalizing here. All I'm saying that this painting shows that this is the bulk of uh, messages this uh, painting gives to its viewers. In that sense, it is a highly influential, aesthetically appealing, beautiful artwork for the Victorian. Because of its content and because of its uh, beauty that serves as uh, a, a, a didactic uh, presenter and uh, maker of uh, social values and norms uh, of the Victorian era. This, if we go even further, this idea of women reading was also a popular uh, motif in uh, many Victorian novels. Um, therefore, uh, this didactic tone uh, was not only a matter of painting but also of literature. And we also see that 19th century um, included uh, a, a problem of um, aesthetics uh, because of that Orientalist movement. Uh, and even through Orientalism, uh, Victorians uh, learned uh, about behaviors, at least they learned how superior their behaviors were compared to those of Africans and Arabs and the Chinese and so on. So you see that the literature and arts of this century, of this period at least, uh, includes many elements from um, diverse backgrounds. In that sense, a comparison of Victorian painting to the paintings of the or the poetry of the aesthetes differ uh, extensively, as we will see and talk about soon. Art for art's sake. Well, art for art's sake, as we say in Turkish, sanat sanat içindir, is a motto translated from the French, l'art pour l'art, which was coined in the early 19th century. Art for art's sake, as a slogan, expresses the belief of those writers and poets and painters and artists, by and large. Uh, who were associated with aestheticism. These people were called the aesthetes. For these people, art needed no justification. It needed serving no political, didactic, or any other message. Art was only for the senses which makes it even more difficult to comprehend because the previous uh, or the traditional understanding of art included a study of a close examination of uh, the social, political, educational, didactic, moral messages. All of which must remind you of the discussion between Plato and Aristo. If you look at this painting on the left, you will see that here this is not quite a, a Victorian painting. Um, this uh, does not really speak for a woman 
who has traditional roles and a family environment with children. And if you look around, you will see that it is rather messy. Uh, there is no order in this room. All these show that, well, the painting is against the Victorian um, value-ridden, uh, didactic, uh, highly moral um, paintings. However, can we say that this painting does not have any message? That's a different debate. We'll talk about them uh, throughout the semester. But for the time being, art for art's sake uh, reminds us that not every artwork, not every literary text had to be uh, abiding uh, those social norms and accepted behaviors and messages and philosophies. Um, that is to say, an artwork does not have to um, be anything other than uh, the artist's or the creator's will and power and enjoyment. When you interrogate the relationship between poetry and the aesthetes, you see that for aesthetes, poetry had nothing to do with this Victorian um, morality. It had nothing to do with didacticism. Literature did not have to teach moral lessons. Literature was not a school. Literature was not a church. It was a rather different field of human endeavor. The aesthetes also insisted that beautiful poetic form attained through perfect workmanship made any poetic content admirable and beautiful. Therefore, for the aesthetes, any topic, any subject could be elaborated. They could write just about anything. So the content did not have to be didactic. Therefore, a bird, the story of a, a poor guy, the relationship between a father and a son, they all could be used in literature as a content. The point was how to talk about it. So unlike those Victorians who believed in art for people's sake, supporters of art for art's sake, that is to say the aesthetes, believed that any content is acceptable. Victorians, on the other hand, believed that content was especially important because through that content, society learned about the manners. Like the French writer Baudelaire, the aesthetes put these arguments into practice by combining lyrical, profound language, complex metrical rhythms, and any subject matter to create aesthetically pleasing poetry. So far, we have learned the importance of uh, the uh, didactic, moral um, importance and function of literature and art in Victorian in the Victorian uh, period. But for the aesthetes, poetry had nothing to do with morals. The supporters of aestheticism argued that art had nothing to do with morality. Instead, 
art was primarily about the elevation of taste and the pure pursuit of poetry. This understanding was all about beauty. This taste and the pursuit of beauty. The aesthetes argued that the arts should be judged on the basis of form rather than morality. Morality was uh, an issue of the church, an issue of the school, but not of literature. The famous motto or slogan, art for art's sake, la pour la, encapsulates this view. It meant prizing the sensual qualities of art and the sheer pleasure it provides. Hence, art for art's sake became identified with the energy and creativity of aestheticism, but it also became a shorthand way of expressing the fears of those who saw this uncoupling art, uncoupling of art and morality as dangerous. Aestheticism unsettled and challenged the values of mainstream Victorian culture as it perlocated more widely into the general culture, it was relentlessly satirized and condemned. You will see uh, soon that Oscar Wilde was one of the most uh, harshly criticized and even ridiculed um, author and artist of that period. When we consider Victorians' reaction to the aesthetes, we see that the aesthetes were um, approached harshly by many Victorians. Mainstream Victorian culture saw art and literature as a means of self-improvement, which resulted in naturally uh, social and cultural and even economic improvement. However, the aesthetes dislocated such socially and culturally problematic um, form uh, that included this moral didacticism. At the expense of profound language use in the literary text, including the, the, uh, the lyric and melodic aspect of uh, the uh, rhyming lines and so on with that elevated profound language use the aesthetes believed that a victorian understanding of literature was very dogmatic poetry for the aesthetes presenters uh, presented readers with moral ambiguity and provided them uh, no comfortable psychological position. That is to say, the poetry of the aesthetes um, not only uh, stood against morality, but also uh, put uh, rather morally problematic issues uh, into the texts they wrote. Um, themes of perverse, perverse sexuality, cruelty, violence um, that the athletes uh, inserted here and there into their texts made many Victorians angry and furious. For these Victorians, aesthetic beauty without moral and noble content was unacceptable. For these Victorians, uh, again, the aesthetes were simply creators of ugly morality. So here you see that Victorians' understanding of literature as a slogan, uh, art for uh, people's sake, uh, disabled them to see what the aesthetes were trying to do. The aesthetes were not really trying to um, 
make literature perverse. Rather, they were trying to uh, give the right of the literature to uh, back to literature. True, literature or literary texts are different from ecclesiastical texts or religious texts. However, uh, Victorian's treatment of literature was rather religious and moral uh, and which and this was um, limiting and disabling for many uh, aesthetes. So uh, here uh, you see that the aesthetes understanding uh, of literature is based on uh, rhythm, rhyme, uh, colors, lines, and uh, language use uh, rather than the content. And this um, approach of theirs towards um, language over content disabled them uh, and blinded them to see the, um, the moral uh, uh, issues that uh, their texts uh, carried. While they were aware of the consequences of their, uh, their decisions in their texts, but when it came to criticism, they did not um, uh, took, they did not take one step back, uh, rather, they um, moved on with their principles and with their uh, understanding of literature uh, in a very uh, blindfolded manner. In many newspapers, Oscar Wilde was depicted as Narcissus, who was in love with himself. He was also called um, with um, terrible adjectives, such as uh, he was after vanity, he was a sham, his egotism was um, unbearable, um, he caused feminization, he was decadent, and his decadence was most visible in his literary work, and he was anti-Christian. All these negative terms were used to describe Oscar Wilde just because he um, walked away from how the Victorians perceived the function of literature. I said in the last slide that the Victorians criticized um, Oscar Wilde heavily on the basis of his uh, literary output. But was that the only reason? Of course not. By following Wilde's dictum that one should either be a work of art or wear a work of art, male aesthetes managed to distance themselves from the problematic realm of fashion. You see that Wilde presented himself as a dandy whose life was a work of art. The way he talked, the people with um, whom he had love affairs, um, the colors he chose, uh, the uh, daily practices with which he um, was engaged, all these show that he was a radical individual who attached, um, who attacked Victorian uh, values and practices uh, in many different fields. He uh, spoke out loudly. He uh, never stopped telling the truth as he believed so. And this uh, exploration of wiles uh, of life and himself caused great trouble. But at the same time, such an action, such a principled action, gave birth to many other aesthetes uh, to grow up, uh, both during his lifetime and uh, the years which followed. 
You must have seen this painting. It's a very famous pre-Raphaelite uh, painting. Although references to the aesthetic movement are commonplace, there was no unified or organized movement as such. Um, critics still disagree about when aestheticism began. Of course, um, it is difficult to uh, pinpoint who should be included under its label. Some associate the movement with the pre-Raphaelites, who were active from the mid-19th century. The uh, pre-Raphaelites uh, put great emphasis on sensual beauty and on strong connections between visual and verbal forms. Perhaps the most important um, phase of aestheticism, however, occurred during the late 1860s and early 1870s with the work of Oscar Wilde. When you closely examine the style of um, the aesthetes, you see that their writing was sometimes condemned as purple prose. That is to say, by you know naming it purple prose, um, it was found to be rather overly elaborate and ornate. That is to say, they uh, the aesthetes. Uh, played with words and wrote um, in detail and in a very elevated language rather than uh, understandable daily language. Um, and to a certain extent, they um, furthered uh, the um, reworking of uh, literary uh, statements made in the 19th century Victorian era. They borrowed from the stylistic uh, techniques of imaginative writing, and their writing was often densely elusive and metaphoric. Wilde's writing, uh, for instance, threw off Victorian ideas about earnest and serious argument for the sake of playfulness and paradox. So uh, we can say that the aesthetes wrote um, in detail, in a highly ornamented way, um, in a very playful, uh, harmonious, but at the same time paradoxical manner. For the Victorians, it was such writing was unacceptable because uh, such writing lacked serious argument and direct statements that uh, passed the messages across easily. As soon as you started reading the picture of Dorian Gray, you must have noticed that uh, Dorian Gray is a unique character. He is not really into social, political, ideological or religious stuff, right? Dorian Gray's passion for studying and collecting jewels or perfumes or ecclesiastical vestments um, or, uh, and surrounding himself with exotic and sensual objects actually shows his endless craving for refined sensory experiences. So we must say that Dorian Gray is in fact an aesthete. He is really into discovering and exploiting his own sensory experiences. The aesthetes were also called the decadents. When you look at the yellow book, um, which um, was an illustrated quarterly uh, with a subtitle La Poulard, uh, the, it was the most famous and notorious of decadent publications. This was a quarterly periodical featuring essays, poems, fictions, along with illustrations. Uh, being launched in 1894 uh, and running until 1897, the, um, the yellow and green colors 
were associated with bruising and decay. Their style, which was found to be decadent, and the yellow book uh, with its content and form uh, with words and illustrations, uh, contributed to the uh, philosophical growth of the uh, aesthetes. You see that, for instance, if you look at the cover of this um, quarterly, the yellow book, you see that it shows um, uh, a food uh, which can be considered to be uh, disgusting uh, from, from the perspective of the Victorians, but at the same time erotic. However, this food also uh, signifies something unseen uh, during that time, that uh, a magazine cover was supposed to uh, show something, you know, big, like a mansion, like a, like a palace, like a big, beautiful painting. But uh, reducing this um, aesthetic uh, largeness of the Victorians, from palaces to artwork, to a food was a direct attack on Victorian uh, critics and artists. Well, of course, the aesthetic um, power of the aesthetes um, became dim uh, towards the end of the 19th century. However, uh, these aesthetes left their legacy. The Rhymers Club, for instance, which was set up by uh, famous poets such as uh, Yeats in 1890s explicitly rejected literary naturalism and embraced experimental modes of writing very similar to the work of the aesthetes. From another corner, symbolist poetry was closely aligned with, with aesthetic and decadent styles. All of these aimed to explore the beauty of the strange. Uh, and subjective and unique moments rather than the social and culturally acceptable um, experiences of the masses. The aesthetes such as Wilde also influenced upcoming writers who reacted against traditional modes of writing and criticism, which argued that arts and literature had to insist on social, cultural, uh, educative and political utilitarianism. These uh, legacies by uh, the aesthetes uh, showed that utilitarianism was no more an issue for arts, which had a profound influence uh, on uh, the artists and um, writers who were to come in the 20th century. Reading and discussion. In the upcoming slide, you will find Oscar Wilde's preface to his novel titled The Picture of Dorian Gray. I want you to read his preface. Study the ideas proposed by Wilde. Discuss how you see Wilde's position by supporting as well as rejecting some of his ideas. Make sure you grasp what Wilde is actually criticizing before you start discussing. In that sense, you have to understand first his position, what he's actually saying, and what is he criticizing? What is his target, in other words? After locating these questions and finding answers to them, then you may start discussing. Well, we have reached the end of the lesson. Throughout your education at Akdeniz University's uh, English Language and Literature Department, you have learned a lot about Victorian novels and 19th century novels. And I'm sure that you had learned something about the aesthetes. For those who do not really um, know much about the uh, aesthetes, 
I have to say that this uh, this group of individuals also served as a bridge between um, the 19th century science and literature and the 20th century uh, exploration of uh, freedom, exploration for freedom and uh, individualism and so on, both in sciences and in arts and literature. Um, so um, our discussions are continuing and make sure that you continue uh, your readings.